What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Data Dash and today is April 15th of 2024. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, I want to spend some time to talk about the intense volatility we've had in crypto markets over the last couple of days. Not only did we see a sustained correction in Bitcoin on Friday and Saturday with the recent rebound, but we also saw a major flush down in altcoin markets with some plays dropping as low as 40 to 50 to even 60% from their previous relative highs back in March. So I wanna spend some time to talk about how we are approaching this market, how we're approaching the uncertainties and the macro tailwinds around the situation with Israel and Iran, and overall give you guys my thoughts about how we're navigating markets. If you happen to enjoy this video, consider dropping a like. Let's go ahead and kick things off. So I wanna spend some time here to obviously talk about what many people believe is the reason for this correction of Bitcoin's price. A lot of people are obviously talking about the events going on between Iran and Israel. And I would say the overall growing uncertainty around peace in the Middle East, uh, which has been a, a timeless topic. Uh, it is something that's always been, uh, you know, in some sense or form, uh, a topic of controversy, a topic at issue in hand at any given time when it comes to geopolitics. And it's always been something that's very tense. But I have to tell you guys here today that while I do believe that this is a relevant story, I think a lot of people are probably brushing it off as a one-time event. Uh, things de-escalated supposedly quite quickly afterwards in some people's view. I'm going to come back to this topic of talking about this, but I want to make it very clear that this was not the sole reason crypto markets pulled back. I think the first question everyone has in their mind is why are things pulling back? Why are things correcting? And to be honest with you guys, I'm going to be very candid in saying this because there's some people who will say this is the only reason it's going down and, you know, or, you know, it's manipulation or yada yada, whatever it might be. I think that there are a lot of really fundamental reasons and we've been talking about this extensively since back at the beginning of April. We've even hinted it a little bit in the later part of March as there was clear signs of this. The first one being that BTC, uh, you know, Bitcoin ETF flows net overall have been flat since back here in mid-March. So we've been in over a near month without that additional boost of liquidity into Bitcoin ETFs when you factor in for the outflows of GBTC. It's put a serious dent in the trend and it doesn't take a genius to realize that, you know, going from around 42,000 Bitcoin and ETF flows from February 8th, for example, climbing up here on the ladder towards the 8th of March, we had a substantial net increase of over 150,000 Bitcoin during that period of time from the ETF inflows, adding much more additional liquidity or buy set pressure into the industry. And that is incredibly different from a near sideways trend for the last month. Very different. So th this is the, the first key component to understand here is that ETF inflows were already weak. And if you don't believe me, take a look here and not only the chart here around this, but also just take a look at Bitcoin's price. Take a look at how the two, in, the, in this case, price action not only has just generally gone sideways, but price has not been able to sustain a hold above the 21 day. We got hints of this back in April 2nd. We saw this back here on March 19th and March 22nd. These were all indicative signs here that the ETF inflows, not only if we were just visualizing the data showcase that the trend was starting to change, but outside of that as well, that very clearly uh, buyers at these levels are not as intense and excited and FOMOing or seething at the teeth to buy Bitcoin as they were back here in January post the ETF launch correction. We had a 91% move off of those lows back when we talked about the bounce potentially playing off on the 100 day. We had a 91% move in Bitcoin's price. We made phenomenal returns on meme coins. We made phenomenal returns on a whole range of different cryptocurrencies. And we even and made some trades here on the rebound uh, during this kind of wave of a lot of altcoins coming off of their lows. But as much as we like to trade those, we are now still in a cash position. And we were pretty much in cash back about a week before things got really intense on the sell side. And there's a good reason for that because we had continued trend weakness on the 21 day. And when you have these kind of events of trend weakness, when you have obviously the main catalyst that drives price, uh, you know, no longer showing up to the plate or it feeling at least like it's exhausted in the case of the ETF inflows, it is a prime opportunity 
where people who think that, oh, only shorts get liquidated, only bears are going to get liquidated, well, a lot of longs got knocked down big time. This was the biggest if we combine these two days together, which I think is pretty fair to say because it's been a, you know, basically a fixed flush down here within the past you know, kind of 24, 48 hours in the prior few days. We saw nearly $1.5 billion in long liquidations alone in these two days. And if you look back at the other days where we had these, you know, you had maybe single day flush downs where some longs got liquidated. This was a wake up call. It was not only a huge pullback on Bitcoin when you really consider now just how big of an asset Bitcoin is. You know, these upper single digit moves are very big when it comes to market cap contraction. But outside of that as well, we finally saw the correction we've talked about on a lot of key altcoins here, waiting for those better discount opportunities. If we take a look at total three, we smashed through the 100-day, almost coming down to tap the 200-day pocket, a near 29% correction from the relative highs back in March. And the important part here that I really want to drive home is that again, if you listen to these signs within price, if you see and notice the struggle at the 21 day, and you notice that you know there's no real need to FOMO here because the market is clearly signaling that right now there, there's something wrong here that either you know you're not getting the kind of bid side support that's going to allow for prices to sustain above those key momentum moving averages like the 21 day. When you get those signs, it's probably best to start taking some chips off the table, locking in profits, you know, deleveraging if you are overexposed to the market and taking excessive risk in anticipation of higher returns. You have to readjust to that new price action reality where we're no longer bouncing directly off the 21 day each and every time and making accelerated moves, but rather stagnating in the trend and not really having either the good price action to get you excited about markets nor the ability for the catalyst like the ETF inflow to continue maintaining the same headline presence that they had back a couple of weeks ago. So it's very important to be consistently observing these things. And I think to be fair, if you keep on top of these things, you'll be able to navigate these kind of downturns much faster rather than just saying, oh, it was this macro event in Iran, uh, you know, between Iran and Israel that caused this. Sure, that definitely might have been the domino to really kick things off. It might have been the catalyst that got a lot of people concerned that led to excess sell side pressure. But the only thing that's going to really cause this cascade of downward moves is a liquidation event and is also going to be much more dramatic the heavier that initial sell side pressure is. So while it might have definitely played a role in catalyzing the move, it is not the only thing that is really causing that excessive sell side pressure. There's too much exposure to derivatives, borrowed money, that leaves people in a position where they are forced sellers. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys the brutal truth at the end of the day why buying when there's blood in the streets usually makes sense is that when there are forced liquidations, there are forced sellers. And when there are forced sellers, you have an opportunity to essentially grab things at the best discount possible and come in as buyers. It is a wealth transfer from those who take excessive risk to those who hold more patience and resilience in their long-term trading strategy. Hence why we talked about preserving and protecting your capital. We, we made a lot of great money over the last couple of months. We came back swinging in Q1 on a lot of different altcoin trades, but at the same time, when we started to see this trend weakness here, we knew, hey man, like, yeah, we might make some great money, but don't be so quick to want to recycle that and go to the next play and keep doubling your money. Because while that might be working in the short term, closer and closer you get to having this period of time when there's stagnation in price. You know, in that case, you're you're expecting to flush down very soon. We sold this in a lot of key plays here. Yeah, you know, thinking I had a lot of people asking me, Nick, when are you gonna buy stacks? When are you gonna buy stacks? And I wasn't really eager about it because for the past month, while stacks had definitely still set in new highs here in April, the trend had really slowed down versus what we had back here in February. And it was clear when, when we came here to the 21 day, I was watching a lot of these charts in early April. When I started to see some of my favorite altcoins and some of the really strong narratives hitting resistance at the 21 day, I knew that hey man, it's probably time to go into cash for any remaining positions we have. Uh, so we've been overwhelmingly in cash. We've missed a lot of this correction here, which is really good. Uh, and the great thing is, is that still, even if you didn't catch it on the flash lows, there might be a good entry here. 
The big thing I want to I want to kind of drive your attention towards, and I'll say the same here also with plays like Render. Render had a phenomenal bounce here. Uh, we made a trade on Render, an entry on it in like the mid six dollar range. You know, easily within like a, an hour or two, made like a really solid like I think upper single digit return, maybe even close to ten percent. Uh, but it was a really great trade. But the main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that you know we're coming up here on these 21-day moving averages for some of these plays, especially those who have been stronger rebound plays like Render. And I want you guys to really focus here not only on those individual plays, but also keep an eye here on total three because how price and general market capitalization for these plays and all these index uh, indices, how they react with the 21-day, I think is going to be your giveaway for the much more important topic, which is where things are really going long term here. I bring it here to the S&P 500 because right now, you know, a lot of people expected over the weekend with the events going on that futures would open up much further down, It'd be a huge gap down, potentially even down to the 100 day with concerns of potentially entering into World War III or the initial stages of a larger global conflict. But overall, the key thing I want you guys to focus on here is to see very clearly now as the markets are opening up, futures are up 0.6%. So they're actually higher than where markets closed on Friday before things really manifested. Um, and above all, my main thing here is that, look, we can talk about world events. We can talk about whether or not they're important or not. But the key thing here is that while markets are not always 100% right, they are a pretty good determining factor. Like the change in the trend, the current price level is a pretty good expectation of where markets should be according to the standards of what's going on in the world, where the economy stands, and how these companies should be performing. So what I'm generally saying here is to lean into price. If the 21-day moving average, which has served as your typical range of support consistently since it was broken back in November 2023, is now starting to act as resistance as it has been, and it continues to do so without price clearing through, that not only lets you know that you shouldn't be following into things, but along with that as well, that you should probably be taking profits on any rebounds and considering that whatever people are talking about, whatever the market may be concerned about, may not even be the conflict in Iran, between Iran and Israel and the instability in the Middle East. It could be a whole set of different things. It could be the market realizing that it had really gotten ahead of itself and overpriced in an amount of Fed rate cuts and now with inflation coming back, they're going to have to cut back on those previous promises or previous in, you know, kind of uh, estimations that a lot of the market had set for the Fed, who really essentially they didn't believe what the Fed was saying, that they're going to keep their target rate where it is, that there's going to be multiple cuts this year. right? So all those things can play a very big role. Um, it could also just be the global liquidity is not really expanding to new highs. We're pretty much flat on M2 for the past couple of years, and that gave us a justification for crypto to come back up because you know it was at a discount valuation to global M2. Same with equities, but now you know the S&P 500, taking it to the monthly, we are trading above the prior highs here. And I understand there's AI. I understand that a lot of people are excited about these different narratives. But we got to get back to the fundamentals, guys. We got to get back to reality, and we got to realize that just because there's a hot narrative doesn't mean it can it can't stop. Because all narratives, all rallies will eventually fizzle out and go through healthy waves and corrections before making their next leg up. Even in an everlasting optimistic world, there are heavy corrections, and they will come when people least expect them. When people are overly euphoric and overly confident that they'll be able to just keep buying the dip, and it keeps going higher. But if you're listening to these moving averages, if you're listening to the signs of price, if you're listening to what the market is telling you, it will start to give you those signs of when it's time for serious capitulation to start coming into the picture. And that's the kind of range where you can get really solid discount opportunities. In the case of stocks, you can buy some of your favorite stocks at 15, 20, 25% correction sometimes, depending on the names you're looking at. Uh, but along with that as well, when it comes to total three and all coins, Right, we'll be able to potentially get some plays down here at the 200 day. I wouldn't say that's completely out of the question. We have yet to get a flush down like that since back in October. While I wouldn't heavily discourage you from building positions now that we've dipped down the 100 day and had a very typical upper 25 to 30% correction 
which we see very commonly and so commonly during the last run-up act in 2020 to 2021. The important thing I would say is to keep in mind that the majority of the returns you're going to make buying into these plays and having the conviction to be able to hold them over the next couple of weeks or months in the event of a broader move is going to be from when they clear to the prior relative high. When we break above $780 billion in market cap, we continue climbing here towards some eventual cycle top. So it's not something where you have to FOMO or go all in. I personally like to buy some entrance on a discount, and then I can deploy additional capital when there's the conviction to get above those moving averages. Because if that starts acting as clear resistance, if this starts to try to rebound very quick, but it doesn't have the steam to clear through that 21 day, and continues to serve as resistance, that's all I need to know that crypto's trend is exhausted. And I know a lot of people believe that now we're at the previous all-time highs, uh, or we're near Bitcoin's prior all-time highs. And therefore, uh, as we've talked about, you know, historically speaking, that's going to be your indicative sign that we're just going to continue charging forward. Um, you know, we talked about some scenarios where obviously Bitcoin could continue going up, but it's always going to be about what price tells us, guys. And right now, as always, you've got to be the biggest skeptic. You always have to assume, uh, in this case, the more conservative scenario is going to play out versus our more optimistic outcomes that we would love to see of six six figure Bitcoin, you know, markets just rallying up and to the right and never stopping, you know, the money printing going to infinite infinity and therefore Bitcoin becoming, you know, the new global standard. Th th these things are very far out, they're relatively low probability. We need to have patience. We need to be understanding that the ETF inflows are getting much weaker. There's probably a reason for that. Um, you know, global liquidity is not rapidly expanding. Whatever people will tell you, you can take a look at most broad measurements of, of global liquidity, whether you're looking directly at central bank balance sheets or at something that's even more optimistic, which is global in two. It's been stalling for the last four to five months. So we've got to keep that in mind here, and we need to be very practical about our estimations about where things can go. Um, again, might be some good rebound trade opportunities here for total three into the 21 day pocket. You could also go back into cash then, wait it out, see how it plays from there. But I think again, the majority of additional gains are going to make the four kind of returns are going to come in when you clear through those prior highs on total three. The only reason why we mentioned specifically to get out of the market at that range is that A, not only can you average here a little bit on discounts and potentially have great trade opportunities for rebounds, but beyond that, we don't want to just simply be holding here, be able to stomach the corrections and run with the assumption that, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to come back. It's going to keep going up and to the right. This is why we're very big about going back to cash uh, when we see clear weakness and, and trend prices, especially when we've made such great returns here over the past couple of months. you just you got to be able to not get too greedy step back and realize that irrespective of what's going on in the macro world like crypto has been making much better returns and their returns in which we should not take for granted and not assume are just going to keep coming our way so you really have to again when you're applying your, your trading or investing strategy everyone's a bit different but for me as a swing trader i'm very like focused in on trying to make sure that i'm not going to get caught uh you know two steps behind and stuff you know, I realized that essentially we, we started going a bit more heavier here in 2024 uh, when, you know, altcoins really had their biggest percentage run up here. You know, since back here in October, this was, we caught again, as we've talked about before, the bigger moves here. We came back swinging in 2024, but we're not going to get caught two steps behind where, you know, we're up really good now, coming a little bit later into the market and then getting caught up in the chop, trying to trade on leverage, trying to take excessive risk. We've just been making great money in the spot market. Now, that's a great way to approach it if you can make that kind of money. Now, one thing I want to let you guys know about as well is it is important to focus in on plays, in my opinion, that are going to be tapping into narratives that are emerging in the crypto industry that have a lot of potential room to grow. So we focused a lot, made some great returns on small mid caps here from this cycle. But the big thing I want you guys to know about is that it's important to focus on emerging narratives. It's important to find those kind of small mid cap plays that aren't, you know, being the central theme or topic for everyone right now that eventually will grow into much larger plays and narratives from their fundamentals, from what they have to offer to the market. One of those projects that I think you guys need to keep on your radar is Angel Block. 
Now, irrespective of like price action, which I genuinely personally believe looks quite nice, you know, we've been able to turn prior resistance here at around 3.5 cents to around 4 cents into new support, which I really like to see that's setting up those broader moves. But putting aside like price action here, I think that Angel Block is a project, as I've been an ambassador of the project for well over nearly two years now. I really love what AngelBlock is focusing on and building an actual serious launch pad for early stage projects. So it's definitely not only a platform where like from an infrastructure play, I really think you guys should keep AngelBlock or the native token Thul on your radar. But beyond that as well, I think you guys should be keeping an eye on the different projects that are raising to the protocol and some of the big updates that are coming. They had the script token raise, which has done phenomenally well. It's up I think about four or five X. From its prior uh, you know initial entry for those who invested on in the angel block platform might have changed a bit here with some of the recent market volatility but beyond that as well the bigger picture thing that i want you guys to keep in mind is that they're constantly building multiple bridges to various networks so that projects from a variety of emerging ecosystems some of the new exciting fundamental projects that are building really exciting DeFi protocols nft protocols different types of narratives uh, maybe even real world assets as well all of these different emerging projects and some of the really exciting infrastructure protocols like Al of Zero, that was one of our three picks for the L1 or new like infrastructure protocols that we're watching. Well, make sure that you focus on plays like AngelBlock that are building the infrastructure to be able to service raises to these different types of ecosystems. They are essentially one of the few multi-chain platforms for raising capital for some of the most serious projects and they have some of the best protections built into the protocol allowing you to understand the overall token metrics of those given projects raising in a clear and transparent way. There's no, you know, kind of behind the scenes token vesting or OTC deals. Everything is on chain and transparent before you even consider investing a ticket in the project. And outside of this, well, they have milestones or what I like to call a sort of tranche, me tranche mechanism of releasing funds on the protocol. And essentially make sure that projects don't just get all the funding right away. And walk away they actually have to meet deliverable goals they have to actively engage in communication and this is again a really solid principle of things like equity crowdfunding which i'm very familiar with and i think overall is what's going to allow angel block to service some of the biggest upcoming projects in this space it's really great because when you're getting into an early stage project you do have a lot of really high kind of asymmetric reward that can come out of it but you also have in this case a fixed amount of risk in this case when you're investing in the project and overall you have that ability to really get on the ground floor and some really exciting ideas so definitely check them out the link down below in the description i think angel block is definitely a project that you guys should keep on your radar and a platform in which may be very helpful for you if you're looking to diversify your portfolio and get exposure to some early stage altcoins but i want to bring it back here to talking about bitcoin the closing remarks here i'm going to signify to you guys come in the form of price action if we are not able, after breaking through this wedge, to really get a sustained close above 68K, which is where the 21-day moving average is, and also where the line of prior support is, give or take, by a couple hundred bucks, if you're generally seeing that there's stagnation here for the next 24, 48 hours, and an inability to clear through those levels, there's a very good fair chance here that we are going to see Bitcoin dip further and altcoins also are likely going to dip further as well. So keep that in mind. While we may be bullish, like, you know, or open the idea that price can still go up and to the right over the next, say, six or 12 months, it is very imperative to understand not to get sidelined or sidetracked by, um, or excuse me, to get surprised, so to speak, if price action whips all down and keeps getting hit here. Because we don't have many good things going for crypto right now. When it comes to the strong narratives like the ETF inflows that we're holding up price, those are getting weaker. We've got the halving event coming up, but this is something that I think in many ways, while it's not technically priced in, uh, the beneficial factors that are actually going to come from the halving event, like that only can be realized after the halving event plays out and the, the monetary uh, supply adjustment of increase or the inflation rate is going to be minimal. I think the, the narrative this time around, this is the thing that's gonna throw off a lot of people the buy side pressure that's come from the narrative of the halving event and the ETF coming into play at the same time has played a much bigger benefit for Bitcoin than the actual halving event is going to have on Bitcoin's price over the next couple of months. That's a call I would say with, with pretty strong confidence. Again, I've made wrong calls in the past, but to me, that's what I sense here. I sense a lot of people looking at the ETF inflows, 
matching it alongside you know the, the, the amount of inflows today uh, will be eight days worth of new Bitcoin inflows uh, when the halving event comes into play. I think these are the kind of rationalizations that people make during late stage portions of cycles to continue justifying why something has to go up when in reality what is much more important is whether or not there's going to be more market sell side pressure or buy side pressure. And I have a feeling the sell side pressure is getting pretty intense. And we've seen that very clearly in price. And it could be an indicative early stage sign that we are likely going lower here for the next foreseeable couple of weeks. Just something to keep in mind here. I think the markets are well overdue for a correction here. It doesn't mean that I'm some perma bear or believe that equities can't keep going up into the right or that crypto can't keep going up into the right. But to ignore that there are some sustained corrections along the way is going to leave a lot of people burnt. And I don't want you guys to be in that position. I'm going to be here during good times and bad, but I'm always going to try, most importantly, to be a rational voice to help you guys navigate these turbulent environments and to actually approach it in a way where long term you can make sizable amounts of returns, not just some returns that you're going to make this week, taking excessive risk and thereby lose them in the next week or two by not following a fixed strategy, but something that's going to allow you to ideally make life changing money and be able to walk away a much better person for it. So that's it for today's video, guys. A lot of little nuggets here, I think, in this video that we shared today. If you enjoyed this video and my rambling, consider dropping a like. It's a great way to support the channel. Make sure to check out Angel Block. And if you guys are also interested, you can check out the Dash Report down below in the description. It's our newsletter. We cover things from a 360-degree uh, window. We made some phenomenal returns on our trade on Render back the other day. To be completely candid, if only I would have held it a little bit longer, would have been even better as well. Render was one of the strongest rebound plays out of the narratives that we track. And really did phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, it's, again, trades like these that we share within the Dash Report Trade Alerts group. Uh, some other people trade along me and did well. So if you guys are interested in those trade alerts, knowing when I'm getting kind of in and out of the market and what plays I'm watching, check it out at the, the uh, link down below in the description. It's a great way to support the channel. You get a 20-page plus report, mid-month webinars where you guys can ask me questions, our dashboard discussion group, the alerts group, so much more. So I hope you guys have a fantastic day wherever you are. If you, again, if you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like, and I'll see you guys right back here on Wednesday. Take care, everyone.